Tolkien was a tinkerer when it came to his writings. Fans need look no further than his first age stories to see the different revisions and versions some of these tales went through. Some are quite different in both the tale itself and even the narrative style. By now, many fans probably realize that Tolkien made changes to The Hobbit between the first and second editions to have things line up with the upcoming The Lord of the Rings. Most notably, Gollum goes from willingly giving the ring to Bilbo to cursing him as a thief. But what many fans may not know is this was not the last time Tolkien would seek to edit and expand his first great Middle-earth book. In 1960, five years after The Return of the King is published, Tolkien sought to bring The Hobbit more in line with The Lord of the Rings, not just in terms of the lore, but in tone and style. Realizing with the second edition the viability of returning to Bilbo's story, Tolkien had, in 1954, written The Quest of Erebor, a chapter-length summary of the events of The Hobbit, but told from Gandalf's perspective. The tale, originally intended to be part of the appendices of The Lord of the Rings, sees Gandalf recounting the tale to the surviving Fellowship members in Minas Tirith, after the coronation of Aragorn as king. While it would not make the cut for the appendices, it would later be published as its own chapter in Unfinished Tales. So what would Tolkien change in his 1960 effort to completely rewrite The Hobbit? One of the first things is one of the most distinct differences between his two great books, the narrator. Readers of The Hobbit will recall that the book's narrator frequently makes comments that don't particularly mesh with what we experience in The Lord of the Rings. The narrator says things like, Gandalf, if you had heard only a quarter of what I have heard about him, and I have only heard very little of all there is to hear, you would be prepared for any sort of remarkable tale. Such sentences and commentary from a narrator work great in a whimsical children's tale, but understandably, Tolkien felt the need to cut the vast majority of the narrator from the revised version. With this removal, we also get the omission of the more modern references found in the book. For instance, the narrator describes Gandalf's fireworks saying, the dragon passed like an express train. A new character we get to meet in the 1960 Hobbit is Gandalf's horse. However, with this tale occurring 77 years prior to the War of the Ring, Shadowfax naturally isn't around yet. Instead, Gandalf has a horse named Roald, who is lent to him by Elrond. Bilbo would observe, Gandalf used no stirrups and seldom held the reins. Roald answered his commands, spoken softly in a strange tongue. Another early change is in the character of Thorin. As noted in The History of the Hobbit by John D. Ratliff, where you can find all three rewritten chapters, Thorin is much more abrupt, especially regarding Bilbo, and shows great concern over property, anticipating his later fall to dragon sickness. Well, your father gave me this map 91 years ago, and I have guarded it ever since. 91 years, cried Thorin. For 91 years you have kept my property. Thorin, said Gandalf quietly, though your fame had reached me, I first met you only a few weeks ago. Until then, the use and meaning of this map was quite unknown to me, and I did not know who it belonged to. Your father could not remember his own name nor yours when he gave me the parchment. If I have chosen my own time for restoring it, you have no right to be angry. I came by it only at the peril of my life, for which I think you owe me some thanks. I give it to you now, he said, handing the map to Thorin with a bow. It's worth noting that Thorin's greater suspicion of Bilbo brings him more in line with the previously mentioned Quest of Erebor chapter. We also find Bilbo to be a bit more foolish than he comes off in the original text. In the second chapter, entitled The Broken Bridge, we see Tolkien attempt to match The Hobbit with The Lord of the Rings geographically. Since Frodo's journey is quite well documented and covers virtually the same route to Rivendell as Bilbo's, it would make sense to fill out the latter. They leave at a leisurely pace from Bag End, staying in good inns along the way and passing other dwarves on the road. A day or two after crossing the Brandywine Bridge, they come to Bree, 
where they stay at the Prancing Pony. The following day, they come to the last inn, also called the Forsaken Inn, as they find it deserted and they camp within its ruins. But the biggest addition in this chapter is a sequence where the company comes to the last bridge to find it broken. This is the very bridge where Glorfindel would later drive off three ring wraiths and leave a green barrel as a sign for Aragorn that the bridge was safe. With the bridge broken, the company must ford the river Horwell. The dwarves and their ponies cross the river when we see Thorin's patience for Bilbo once again quite thin. Thorin mopped his face, wet with sweat, rain, and spray. Well, we've managed that, he said. On we go. There's no shelter here. Don't you want the Hobbit anymore? said Gandalf. I think you may need him. They had quite forgotten poor Bilbo. There he was still on the other side, sitting and shivering, more frightened than he had yet been in his life. Confound your Hobbit, said Thorin. When will he learn to look after himself? In time, said Gandalf. Sooner than you expect. Mr. Baggins, he called. Don't try crossing by yourself. Your pony is small. I will come and help. After all are across, Bomber's pony bolts back toward the river, and in the confusion, Feely and Keeley are nearly drowned, and the pony is saved from the water at the cost of most of its baggage, which turns out to be the best part of the company's food supplies. Once again, we see Gandalf speak to Roald, who neighs loudly and seems to calm the restless ponies. Another thing noted in the history of The Hobbit is that Tolkien sought to further fill out the individual dwarf characters. Keely and Feely spring into action when the pony bolts into the water, Bomber is more fumbling and grumbling, and Balin is more hesitant about the woods north of the road, establishing his good judgment. For just as in the original book, they would come face to face with three trolls. After their troll encounter, they again find the Troll Horde where there are three mighty blades. Gandalf took one and presented the other to Thorin. To Bilbo, he gave a knife with a silver pommel. A gift for a good hobbit, he said with a bow, which pleased Bilbo very much. Though he did not himself feel that he had earned any praise, he looked at the knife. It had a sheath of black figured leather, and when he drew it, he saw that the blade was bright and unstained. It was long enough to serve a hobbit as a sword. These look to be good blades too, said the wizard, half drawing the swords and examining them closely. They were not made by any troll, nor by any smith among men of these days, but there is black blood on them, goblin blood. When they are cleaned and the runes on them can be read, we shall know more about them. Note here the addition of black blood on both Orcrist and Glamdring, the two swords which already possess runes likely filling a potential plot hole that Gandalf would no doubt have been capable of reading elvish runes without Elrond's aid. Here they simply need cleaned before such analysis can be given. We also find out that as Gandalf was scouting ahead, he met two of Elrond's people from Rivendell. From them, he finds out that the rangers were about and that they feared three trolls had settled in the woods where Gandalf had left the dwarves. Realizing the peril, Gandalf decided to go back quickly, where he is able to rescue the company. Not only does this give us some background into Gandalf's time looking ahead, but we also get the reference to the Dúnedain Rangers. In the third chapter, Arrival in Rivendell, we find a much shorter passage, not a full chapter like the previous two. Here we find Gandalf makes mention that few dwarves have ever seen the Valley of Rivendell which Ratliff notes is a slight tweak from what he originally wrote in this 1960 rewrite, saying no dwarf has looked upon the Valley of Rivendell, meaning that Thorin and company are the first dwarves to come to Imladris. In the rewrite, it is also made known that the dwarves are not particularly welcome in Rivendell, in an effort to bring it more in line with how the elves of Lorien react to Gimli's presence in their realm. However, it is here that Tolkien would abandon his efforts to do a rewrite of The Hobbit. In his book, Ratliff brings up later bits of the story, wondering how Tolkien might have expanded on them. Did Bilbo begin his friendship with Aragorn by meeting the now 10-year-old in Rivendell? Did Legolas fight in the Battle of Five Armies? Would we have learned more of Radagast? 
Would the spiders of Mirkwood have been more horrific like Shelob? Would Balin's visit to Bag End in the epilogue have included a mention of his aspirations for re-establishing Moria? And would the ring have been a more sinister presence throughout the book, perhaps with hints of corruptive influence on Bilbo as the story progressed? As Ratliff points out, these are questions we will never know the answers to. And we further learn from Christopher Tolkien why this whole effort was abandoned. He says that his father lent these chapters to a friend to get an outside opinion on them. As History of the Hobbit states, we do not know this person's identity, but apparently her response was something along the lines of, this is wonderful, but it's not the Hobbit. She must have been someone whose judgment Tolkien respected, for he abandoned the work and decided to let the Hobbit retain its own autonomy and voice rather than completely incorporate it into the Lord of the Rings as a lesser prelude to the greater work. Yet these writings, also known as the fifth phase, would not be the last time Tolkien would make tweaks to The Hobbit. Due to a rather wild copyright loophole in the US, a company called Ace Books was able to publish an unauthorized print of The Lord of the Rings. This development, worthy of a video itself, led Tolkien's publishers to request new editions of both The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit. For The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien revised the appendices, expanded the prologue, added an index, and a new foreword. Turning to The Hobbit, Tolkien made a few small changes, but nothing on the scale of his 1960 rewrite. Indeed, it is believed that Tolkien had so fully set aside this attempt that he didn't reference any of it in making his 1966 third edition of the book. In the third edition, we find smaller changes, like Erebor being founded by Thrain I, many years before the time of its original founder, Thror, grandfather of Thorin. Tolkien also took the opportunity to eliminate the use of the word gnomes to refer to elves. This not only brought it in line with The Lord of the Rings, but also the ever-present project of his passion, the book he would strive all his life to write and publish, yet would never do so in his lifetime, The Silmarillion. Now, if you haven't already, I highly suggest checking out both The History of the Hobbit and The Annotated Hobbit. Both are phenomenal resources that give you a peek behind the curtain at the creation of Tolkien's first great Middle-earth book. As always, I want to say a huge thank you to all my Patreon and YouTube supporters who make this channel possible. Tom DeBombadil19, Lissamy the Cinda, Rabbi Rob Thomas, Charles Leisure, CCDC Red Team, Joe Tepper, The Mighty Mim, Andrew Carlisle, Swirled Traveler, Matthew Jeffrey, Viking Lord, Leo Vittori, Sky Carcass, Slide Belts, Dane Ragnarsson, Berto Berg, Graham Derricott, The Dark Haired One, Wyland, Michael Wu, and Debbie. If you enjoyed the artwork in this video, check out the artists in the description to purchase prints of their great work for yourself. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Nerd of the Rings.